大家好，大家好。今日咧，我哋繼續我哋嘅遠大前程啊 ，Charles Dickens The Great Expectations 嘅第十五節，我哋第十四次錄音。上一次講到邊度咧？講到去 Pip 講佢嘅心路歷程。係啊，佢心路歷程係點樣樣啊？係咪好係咪好順利啊？佢肯定自己想變為上等嘅。咁<笑>但係佢而家嘅狀態係點咧？佢而家同阿 Jo register 咗啊嘛。啊，咁係咪一作為一佢一個未來嘅鐵匠，係咪一個衝上上台嗰度？唔係佢所諗嘅。係啦，佢覺得係反而係拖佢後腿喎。係嘛？咁佢就即係佢覺得阿 Jo 係好嘅，但係係啊，佢只不過。佢話佢冇得翻轉頭啦。係啊，係佢知道自己咁樣係唔好嘅，唔啱嘅，但係冇辦法，佢已經踏上呢、這個攤上枝頭變鳳凰。係啊，冇錯。咁我哋繼續睇下 Pip 會將會發生咩事好冇 ？As I was getting too big for Mr. Wopsle's great aunt's room, my education under that preposterous female terminated。即係佢唔繼續喺度。扮做上等人啦，即係佢唔去學啦，佢覺得佢已經已經識噶啦咁樣。Not, however, until Biddy had imparted me everything she knew, from the little catalogue of prices to a comic song she had once bought for a half penny. Although the only coherent part of the latter piece of literature were the opening lines. 佢有佢有個少少嘅。睇住佢歌仔喎，睇下咩先。When I went to Lunan Town, sirs, to rule, to rule, to rule, to rule, wasn't I done very brown, sirs, to rule, to rule, to rule, to rule. Still, in my desire to be wiser, I got this composition by heart with the utmost gravity. Nor do I recollect that I question its merit, except that I thought the amount of to rule somewhat in excess of the poetry. In my hunger for information, I made proposals to Mr. Wopsle to bestow some intellectual crumbs upon me, with which he kindly complied. As it turned out, however, that he only wanted me for a dramatic lay figure, to be contradicted and embraced and embraced and and wept over and bullied and clutched and stabbed and knocked about in a variety of ways. I soon declined that course of instruction, though not until Mr. Wopsle, in his poetic fury, Had severely mauled me. Whatever I acquired, I tried to impart to Joe. This statement sounds too so well that I cannot, in my conscience, let it pass unexplained. I wanted to make Joe less ignorant and common, that he might be worthier of my society and less open to Estella's reproach. 即系佢不停咁样传播佢嘅知识俾阿 Joe 啊，佢希望同阿 Joe 嘅距离冇咁远啊。The old battery out on the marshes were a place of study, and a broken slate and a short piece of slate pencil were our educational implements, to which Joe always added a pipe of tobacco. I never knew Joe to remember anything from one Sunday to another, or to acquire under my tuition any piece of information whatever. Yet he would smoke his pipe at the battery with a far more sagacious air than anywhere else. Even with a learned air, as if he considered himself to be advancing immensely, dear fellow, I hope he did. It was pleasant and quiet out there with the sails on the river passing beyond the earthwork, and sometimes, when the tide was slow, looking as if they belonged to sunken ships that were still sailing on the bottom of the water. Whenever I watched the vessels standing out to sea with their white sails spread, I somehow thought of Miss Havisham and Estella, and whenever the light struck a slant. Afar off, upon a cloud or sail or green hillside or waterline, it was just the same. Miss Havisham and Estella and the strange house and the strange life appeared to have something to do with everything that was picturesque. One Sunday, when Joe, greatly enjoying his pipe, had so plumed himself on being most awful dull that I had given him up for the day, I lay on the earthwork for some time with my chin on my hand, descrying traces of Miss Havisham and Estella all over the prospect. In the sky and in the water, until at last I resolved to mention a thought concerning them that had been much in my head. Joe said, "I, don't you think I ought to make Miss Havisham a visit?" Well, Pip returned Joe, slowly considering, "What for? What for, Joe? What is any visit made for?" There is some visits, perhaps," said Joe, 
as for ever remains open to question pin. But in regard to visiting Miss Havisham, she might think you wanted something, expected something of her. Don't you think I might say that I did not, Joe? You might, old chap, said Joe, and she might credit it. Similarly, she might not. Joe felt, as I did, that he had made a point there, and he pulled hard at his pipe to keep himself from weakening it by repetition. You see, Pip, Joe pursued as soon as he was past that danger. Miss Havisham done the handsome thing by you. When Miss Havisham done the handsome thing by you, she called me back to say to me as that it were all. Yes, Joe, I heard her. All, Joe repeated very emphatically. Yes, Joe, I heard you. I heard her. Which I meant to say, Pip, it might be that her manning were making an end of it, as you was, me to the north and you to the south, keep in Sundays. I had thought of that too, and it was very far from comforting me to find that he had thought of it, for it seemed to render it more probable. But Joe, yes, old chap, here am I, getting on in the first year of my time, and since the day of my being bound, I have never thanked Miss Havisham, or asked after her, or shown that I remember her. That's true, Pip, and unless she was to turn her out on a set of shoes all four round, and which I meant to say as even a set of shoes all four round might not be acceptable as a present, in a total vacancy of hoofs. I don't mean that sort of remembrance, Joe. I don't mean a present. But Joe had got the idea of a present in his head and must harp upon it. Or even, said he, if you was helped to knocking her up a new chain for the front door, or say a gross or two of shark-headed screws for general use, or some like fancy article, such as a toasting fork when she took her muffins, or a gridiron, or a gridiron when she took a sprat, or such like. I don't mean any present at all, Joe, I interposed. Well, said Joe, still harping on it as though I had particularly pressed it. If I was yourself, Pip, I wouldn't. No, I would not. For what's a door chain when she's got one always up? And shark headers is open to misinterpretation to misrepresentations. And if it was a toasting fork, you'd go into brass and do yourself no credit. And oncommonest workman can't show himself oncommon in a grid, on a gridrin. For a gridrin is a gridrin, said Joe, steadfastly impressing it upon me, as if he were endeavouring to rouse me from a fixed delusion. And you may aim at what you like, but a gridrin, it will come out either by your leave or again your leave, and you can't help yourself. My dear Joe, I cried in desperation, taking hold of his coat. Don't go on in that way. I never thought of making Miss Havisham any present. No, Pip, Joe assented, as if he had been contented for that all along. And what I say to you is, you are right, Pip. Yes, Joe, but what I wanted to say was that as we are rather slack just now, if you would give me a half holiday tomorrow, I think I would go uptown and make a call on Miss Havisham. Which her name, said Joe gravely, ain't as Havisham, Pip, unless she had been rechristened. I know, Joe, I know. It was a slip of mine. What do you think of it, Joe? In brief, Joe thought that if I thought well of it, he thought well of it. But he was particularly in stipulating that I were not received with cordiality. cordiality. Or if I were not encouraged to repeat my visit as a visit which had no ulterior object but was simply one of gratitude for a favour received, then this experimental trip should have no successor. By these conditions, I promised to abide. Now, Joe kept a journeyman at weekly wages whose name was Olick. He, pret he pretended that his Christian name was Stoge, a clear impossibility, but he was a fellow of that obstinate disposition that I believe him to have been the prey of no delusion in this particular, but willfully to have imposed that name upon the village as an affront to his understanding. He was a broad-shouldered, loose-limbed, swarthy fellow of great strength, never in a hurry and always slouching. He never even seemed to come to his work on purpose, but would slouch in as if by mere accident. And when he went to the jolly bargeman to eat his dinner, or went away at night, he would slouch out, like Cain or the wandering Jew, 
as if he had no idea where he was going and no intention of ever coming back. He lodged at a slice keepers out on the marshes, and on working days would come slouching from his hermitage, with his hands in his pocket and his dinner loosely tied in a bundle round his neck and dangling on his back. On Sundays, he mostly lay all day on the slice gates or stood against ricks and barns. He always slouched locomotively with his eyes on the ground and when a coast when a coasted or otherwise required to race them, he looked up in a half resentful, half puzzled way, as though the only thought he ever had was that it was rather an odd and injurious fact that he should never be thinking. This morose journeyman had no liking for me. When I was very small and timid, he gave me to understand that the devil lived in the back in the black corner of the forge, and that he knew the fiend very well. Also, that it was necessary to make up the fire once in seven years with a live boy, and that I might consider myself fuel. When I became Joe's apprentice, Olick was perhaps confirmed in some suspicion that I should displace him. Howbeit, he liked me still less. Not that he ever said anything or did anything openly importing hostility. I only noticed that he always spit his sparks in my direction, and that whenever I sang Oak Clam, he came in out of time. Doge Olick was at work and present next day when I reminded Joe of my half holiday. He said nothing at the moment, for he and Joe had just got a piece of hot iron between them, and I was at the bellows. And by and by, he said, leaning on his hammer, "Now, master, sure you're not a going to favour only one of us. If young Pip has a half holiday, do as much for old Olick." I suppose he was about five and twenty, but he usually spoke of himself as an ancient person. Why? What will you do with a half holiday if you get it? Said Joe. What will I do with it? What will he do with it? I'll do as much with it as him. I will do as much with it as him. Said Oleg. As to Pip, he's going uptown. Said Joe. Well then, as to old Oleg, he's going uptown. Retorted that worthy. Two can go uptown. Tain't only one what go uptown. Don't lose your temper. Said Joe. Shall, shall if I like," growled Olick. "Some and their uptowning. Now, master, come. No favouring in the shop. Be a man." A master refusing to entertain the subject until the journeyman was in a better temper, Olick plunged at the furnace, drew out a red hot bar, made at me with it as if he were going to run it through my body, whisked it round my head, laid it on the anvil, hammered it out as if it were I. I thought, and the sparks were in my spurting blood, and finally said, when he had hammered himself hot and the iron cold, and he began lean on his hammer. Now, master, are you all right now? Demanded Joe. Ah, I'm all right," said gruff old Olick. Then, as in general, you stick to your work as well as most men," said Joe. "Let it be a half holiday for all." My sister had been standing silent in the yard, within hearing. She was the most unscrupulous spy and listener, and she instantly looked in at one of the windows. "Like you, you fool," said she to Joe. Giving holidays to great idle hulkers like that, you are a rich man upon my life to waste wages in that way. I wish I was his master. You'll be everybody's master if you durst," retorted Olick with an ill-favoured grin. "I'll be a match for all noodles and all rogues," returned my sister, beginning to work herself into a mighty rage. "And I couldn't be a match for the noodles without being a match for your master, who's the dunder-headed king of the noodles." And I couldn't be a match for the rogues without being a match for you, who are the blackest-looking and the worst rogue between this and France. Now, you're a foul shrew, Mother Gargery," growled the journeyman. "If that makes a judge of rogues, you ought to be a good one." What did you say? cried my sister, beginning to scream. What did you say? What did that fellow Olick say to me, Pip? What did he call me? With my husband standing by? Oh, oh, oh! Each of these exclamations was a shriek, and I must remark on my sister. What is equally true of all the violent women I have ever seen? That passion was no excuse for her, because it is undeniable that instead of lapsing into passion, she consciously and deliberately took extraordinary pains to force herself into it, and became blindly furious by regular stages. What was the name he gave me before the basement, who swore to defend me? Oh, hold me! Oh, ah! Growled the gentleman between his teeth. I'll hold you if you was my wife. I'll hold you under the pump and choke it out of you. Oh, to hear him! 
cried my sister with a clap of her hands and a scream together, which was her next stage. To hear the name he's giving me, that Oleg, in my own house, me, a married woman, with my husband standing by, oh, oh! Here my sister, after a fit of clappings and screaming, speed her hands upon her bosom and upon her knees and threw her cap off and pulled her hair down, which were the last stages on her road to frenzy. Being by this time a perfect fury and a complete success, she made a dash at the door, which I had fortunately locked. What could be the wretched Joe do now, after his disregarded parenthetical interruptions, but stand up to his journeyman and ask him what he meant by interfering betwixt himself and Mrs. Joe, and further whether he was man enough to come on? Old Oleg felt that the situation admitted of nothing less than coming on, and was on his defence straight away. So, without so much as pulling off their singed, their singed and burned aprons, they went on. They went at one another like two giants. But if any man in that neighbourhood could stand up, up long against Joe, I never saw the man. Oleg, as if he had been of no more account than the pale young gentleman, was very soon among the cold dust, and in no hurry to come out of it. Then Joe unlocked the door and picked up my sister, who had dropped insensible at the window, and who was carried into the house and laid down, and who was recommended to revive, and would do nothing but struggle and clench her hands in Joe's hair. Then came that singular calm and silence which succeed all uproars, and then, with the fake sensation which I have always connected with such a love, namely, that it was Sunday and somebody was dead, I went upstairs to dress myself. When I came down again, I found Joe and Oleg sweeping up without any tr other traces of discomposure than a slit in one of Oleg's nostrils, which was neither expressive nor ornamental. A pot of beer had appeared from the jolly bargeman, and they were sharing it by turns in a peaceful manner. The Lao had a sedative and philosophical influence on Joe, who followed me out into the road and say as a parting observation that, may, that might do me good, on the rampage pip, and off the rampage pip, such is life. With that, with what absurd emotions I found myself again going to Miss Havisham's matters little here, nor how I passed and repassed the gate many times before I could make up my own mind to ring, nor how I debate whether I should go away without ringing, nor how I should undoubtedly have gone if my time had been my own to come back. Miss Sarah Pocket came to the gate, no Estella. How then, you here again, said Miss Pocket, what do you want? When I said that I only came to see how Miss Havisham was, Sarah evidently deliberated whether or not whether or no she should send me about my business, but unwilling to hazard the responsibility she let me in, and presently brought the sharp message that I was to come up. Everything was unchanged, and Miss Havisham was alone. Well, said she, fixing her eyes upon me, I hope you want nothing, you'll get nothing. No, indeed, Miss Havisham, I only wanted you to know that I'm doing very well in my apprenticeship and I'm always much obliged to you. There, there, said the old restless fingers. Come now and then, come on your birthday. I, she cried suddenly, turning herself and her chair towards me. You are looking round for Estella, eh? I have been looking round, in fact, for Estella, and I stammered that I hoped she was well. Abroad, said Miss Havisham, educating for a lady, far out of reach, prettier than ever, admired by all who see her. Do you feel that you have lost her? There was such a malignant enjoyment in her utterance of the last words that she broke into such a disagreeable laugh that I was at a loss what to say. She spared me the trouble of considering by dismissing me. When the gate was closed upon me by Sarah of the walnut shell countenance, I felt more than ever dissatisfied with my home and with my trade and with everything. And that was all I took by that motion. As I was loitering along the high street looking in this consolate disconsolately at the shop windows and thinking what I would buy if I were a gentleman. Who should come out of the bookshop but Mr. Mr. Wopsle? Mr. Wopsle had, had in his hand the affecting tragedy of George Barnwell, in which he had the moment infested sixpence, with the view of heaping every word of it on the head of Pumplecook, with whom he was going to drink tea. No sooner did he see me than he appeared to consider that a special providence had put a prentice in his way to be read at, and he laid hold of me, and insisted on my accompanying him to the Pumblecookian parlour, as I knew it would be miserable at home, and as the nights were dark and the way was dreary, I almost 
and almost any companionship on the road was better than none. I made no great resistance. Consequently, we turned into Pumblecooks just as the street and the shops were lighting up. As I never assisted at any other representation of George Barnwell, I don't know how long it may usually take, but I know very well that it took until half past nine o'clock that night and that when Mr. Wopsle got into Newgate, I thought he never would go to the scaffold. He became so much slower than at any former period of his disgraceful career. I thought it a little too much that he should complain of being cut short in his flower after all, as if he had not been running to seed, leaf after leaf, ever since his course began. This, however, was a mere question of length and wearisomeness that stung me, was the identification of the whole affair with my unoffending self. When Barnwell began to go wrong, I declared that I felt positively apologetic. Bumblecook's in indignant stare so taxed me with it. Wopso too took pains to present me in the worst light. At once ferocious and molden, I was made to murder my uncle with no extenuating circumstances whatever. Millwood put me down in argument on every occasion. It became sheer monomania in my master's daughter to care a button for me. And all I can say for my gasping and procrastinating conduct on the fatal morning is that it was worthy of the general feebleness of my character. Even after I was happily hanged and Wopso had closed the book, Pumblecook sat staring at me and shaking his head and saying, take warning, boy, take warning, as if it were a well-known fact that I contemplated murdering a near relation, provided I could only induce one to have the weakness to become my benefactor. It was a very dark night when it was all over, and when I set out with Mr. Wopsle on the walk home, beyond town, we found a heavy mist out, and it fell wet and thick. The turnpike lamp was a blur, quite out of the lamp, usual place, apparently, and its rays looked solid substance. Tam <clears throat> And its place... And his place and his rays looked solid substance on the fog. We were noticing this and saying how that the mist rose through the change of wind from a certain quarter of our marshes when we came upon a man slouching under the lee of the turnpike house. Halloa, we said, stopping. Oleg there? Ah, he answered, slouching out. I was standing by a minute on the chance of company. You are late, I remarked. Oleg not unnaturally answered. Well, and you are late. We have been, said Mr. Wop, so exalted with his late performance. We have been indulging, Mr. Oleg, in an intellectual evening. Old Oleg growled as if he had nothing to say about that, and we all went together. I asked him presently whether he had been spending his half holiday up and downtown. Yes, said he, all of it. I come in behind yourself. I didn't see you, but I must have been pretty close behind you. By the by, the guns is going again. At the hopes, said I, aye, there's some of the birds flown from the cages. The guns have been going since dark about. you hear one presently. In fact, we had not walked many yards further when a well-remembered boom came towards us, deadened by the mist and heavily rolled away along the low grounds by the river as if it were pursuing and threatening the fugitives. A good night for cutting off in, said Oleg. We'd be puzzled how to bring down a jailbird on the wing tonight. The subject was a suggestive one to me and I thought about it in silence. Mr. Wopso, as the ill-requited uncle of the evening's tragedy, fell to meditating aloud in his garden at Camberwell. Oleg, with his hands in his pockets, slouched heavily on my side. It was very dark, very wet, very muddy, and so we splashed along. Now and then the sound of signal cannon broke upon us again and again, rolled sulkily along the course of the river. I kept myself to myself and my thoughts. Mr. Wopso died amiably at Camberwell, an exceedingly game on both Bosworth, Bosworth Field and in the greatest agonies at Glastonbury. Oleg sometimes growled, Beat it out, beat it out, old Clem, with a clink of the stout, old Clem. I thought he had been drinking, but he was not drunk. Thus we came to the village. The way by which we approached it took us past three jolly bargemen, which we were surprised to find, it being eleven o'clock in a state of commotion, with the door wide open and unwanted lights that has been hastily caught up and put down scattered about. Mr. Wopso dropped in to ask what was the matter, but came running out in a great hurry. There's something wrong, said he, without stopping. Up at your place, Pip, run all. What is it? I asked, keeping up with him. So did Orlick at my side. 
I can't quite understand. The house seems to have been finally entered when Joe Gargery was out, supposedly by convicts. Somebody has been attacked and hurt. We were running too fast to admit of more being said, and we made no stop until we got into our kitchen. It was full of people. The whole village was there, all in the yard. And there was a surgeon, and there was Joe, and there were a group of women, all on the floor in the midst of the kitchen. The unemployed bystanders drew back when they saw me, and so I became aware of my sister, lying without sense or movement on the bare boards where she had been knocked down by a tremendous blow on the back of the head, dealt by some unknown hand when her face was turned towards the fire, destined never to be on the rampage again while she was the wife of Joe. 好似表面上好似發生好多嘢咁，其實就係阿 Pip 想去探 reception， 然之後就去探咗佢，然之後個老婆婆就同佢講：，誒 ，Stella 走咗去讀書啦，走咗去國外啦，你掛住佢啦。然之後阿 Pip 就走啦。咁然之後佢就上翻入醒，就遇到 Mr. Wopsle 啊呢啲咁嘅人啦。咁然之後就。大家喺度讀下書啊，傾下偈啊，咁其實冇乜癮嘅。跟住 on the way 翻去，唔係跟住翻到屋企咧，就大件事啦。其實最大件事就係翻到屋企。翻屋企咩事咧？就係佢家姐俾人喺後腦剝暈咗。然之後阿 Jo 唔知有冇傷到，但係佢屋企好明顯就係啲人話就係俾人哋爆格，可能係俾啲逃犯嗰啲罪犯走入去爆格，就係、是。咁我哋下一次睇下呢個阿 Jo 有冇事啦，或者佢佢佢家姐嘅情況係點啦，好嘛？嗯。O、okay, K， 好，我下次再傾，拜拜。拜拜